Okay, great. Welcome back to pseudo lecture uh, number five. Uh, the plan for uh, for today is I want to uh, discuss more uh, the last bit of things on sheaves we want to know, uh, and then we can get to actually dealing with the algebra and geometry dictionary. So let me just start this time with sheaves, uh, and uh, let me just first remind you of where uh, of things we talked about last time. Uh, we have the notion of compatible stocks, and so secretly this is going to be the notion of espaciatelle. Uh, and so wh what that was is if you have your, your space X uh, and then and you have a sheaf on it, then you have this notion of compatible stocks where you have, you basically take all the different stocks at all the different points. So above P, you put the stock at P and above Q, you put the stock at Q. Uh, and uh, the way to picture compatible stocks or the espace uh, tale is to imagine that if you have uh, a, you want to pick a germ of a section of F at every point, but at each point, uh, if you have a germ, that means that you have a, uh, that should extend to an honest section over some open set. Uh, so a germ is uh, the data of a, uh, uh, open sets up to equivalence in sections there. And so what we're gonna want is that there is an honest open set where all the germs, where F, that germ in FP agrees with all the germs nearby. And if you do this for every single one, you get the notion of a sheaf of compatible germs. Uh, and, so, uh, and so this works e uh, even if F is a pre-sheaf and that's useful uh, because you can then uh, define uh, a map from a pre-sheaf to its sheaf of compatible germs. And this will in fact be the sheafification, meaning that it satisfies the universal property that if you have a sheaf G, uh, and you have a map of pre-sheaves, then there exists, a, you, there exists a unique map like that. Okay, so that's, that's a handy thing to know. Uh, uh, and then the other thing to recall from last time uh, is that if you have a sheaf on a topological space X, then you have uh, the notion of, and if you have a base of the topology of X, you, have the no, you can restrict the information of the sheaf to just knowing what's going on in the base, and that's enough you to recover the entire sheet. So uh, hey, it's so a Ravi. Yeah, you can only see a white screen currently. And uh, so you're, you might just zoom out, I guess. I think you might have pinched in or something. Ah, uh, great. Oh, this is interesting that what you see is not what I see. So that so means... maybe someone else can help with uh, uh, that's that's a, yeah, 20 that's seconds. Okay. Delay. I, I will just know put, exactly where you are right now. I think I will make my screen, make sure I can see what you see on my screen as well. Good. So if I'm not mistaken, for people, maybe the uh, uh, people who are on Zoom, not YouTube, can let me know. Do you see this picture now? Uh, no, I think you need no. to reconnect, disconnect and reconnect your uh, This is not good. That's a pain. iPad. Uh, OK, thanks. In that case, I need to. There's some funny uh, trivial sheaf jokes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think it's telling me I am successfully sharing again. Yes. And now, great. And now you see that. Good. That Let looks me great. Appears. Um, okay. So to, just to make sure uh, we're on the same page somewhat literally, that uh, I was just reviewing what compatible stocks are and how to think of them, uh, and then how we get sheafification from that. So, uh, and, uh, and now we're talking about sheaves on a base. So the idea uh, is that uh, if you have a base on the topology, you, uh, and you only know the information about the sheaf 
on the open sets appearing in that base, you still know the sections and the restriction maps for everything. So for example, in this picture, if you have U1 through U3 are open sets uh, in, the, uh, in, this, uh, in the base, then the dealing with the union of the three, knowing what sections are over this union, even though that's not uh, something in the uh, base, you just need open sets on U1, U2, and U3, and have them agree on the overlap. And now I suspect I'm gonna lose you maybe if I, okay, hopefully you are still seeing this. Uh, and let me know if you're not. Uh, great, so how do you go backwards? If I tell you only the sheaf on the base, which is, if I tell you only the restriction of the sheaf to the sheaf on the base, how do you go back? Well, you're, you still know what the germs are because you can still take small open sets in the base containing the point. Uh, and this will produce a sheaf for you. And then the thing you need to check once and for all in your life is that if you have the data of a sheaf on a base, uh, which has some axioms, that's enough to know that it came from an honest to goodness sheaf. Okay, so now comes the new thing I'd like to talk about, which is uh, the inverse image sheaf, which is somehow the uh, partner to the push forward sheaf. And I find this more complicated uh, when I first see this than, I, than uh, I would have guessed. So that's why I've left it for the end. And so here's the idea behind the inverse image sheet. So if we have a map of topological spaces from X to Y, which I'm calling pi, uh, then uh, uh, we, if, if we have a sheaf on X, we already know we can make a push forward sheaf on Y and that was fairly cheap in terms of uh, open sets. So we get this functor from sheaves of sets or sheaves of abelian groups or sheaves of rings or anything from X, sheaves of sets on X to sheaves of sets on Y. And now what we're gonna describe uh, is some, a way of pulling back. Uh, and so the, let me, uh, so, so we have a sheaf on Y, we're gonna get uh, something that's pulled back to X. Gonna keep, refreshing and I'm hoping I'm not gonna lose my, uh, uh, lose the screen. Um, I should say to the shepherds on Zoom, I can't see you now and I'm afraid to see you because I may lose the screen. So just call out if something bad is happening rather than just waving. Uh, so, we, so what we're going to do is define this pullback sheaf or inverse image sheaf. Uh, you might think about it as, I you might wonder why we don't call it this. Uh, and you, you can think about this and you might ask why we don't call it the pullback sheaf. I'm not sure about that. And the, uh, but the real issue why we don't call it pi upper star uh, is because we're gonna use that for something else, unfortunately. So just deal with the fact that we have an upper minus one there. And so this is gonna be something which will take sheaves of sets on X, Y and pull them back to sheaves and sets on X. And it's gonna be very related, but it, it looks really quite different, at least to me uh, from push forward. Uh, and so here is, uh, here's, here's what it is. As, uh, and I don't have a single best definition to give you. And I much prefer to have a bunch of definitions that are uh, each have different advantages and, and disadvantages. So uh, the first definition that I think is quite nice uh, in some ways is by adjointness, that you define it as something which is a uh, which is as left adjoint to the push forward. So just to remind you, we have a map of topological spaces. I'm now going to put G on the left and F on the right. And I put arrows for morphisms. And this says that these are sheaves. And so it's the same that if you have a map, whoops. Like if you have a map uh, uh, from the uh, inverse image of G to F, that's the same as the map of map from G to the push forward. So that's great because you have the entire adjoint formalism you can use. And uh, the disadvantage of it is that it's not, it doesn't, that's not a definition. If it exists, it's, it exists up to unique isomorphism. And I should say that also your intuition, that's very formal. You lose the, like, the geometry of what's going on. So that's one great definition or one bad definition. Uh, here's a second great and bad definition. Um, this is one, uh, this one is dedicated to Jonathan Wise because it's a espace tale type thing. And so here's the idea of the second definition. So if you have your sheaf G on Y, 
Well, it's got a bunch of stocks uh, at every point of Y, which I'm drawing in, I don't know what this picture exactly is supposed to indicate, but those are all stocks. Uh, and so now I'll tell you what the stocks of the inverse image are. They are, the stocks at any point up here is defined to be exactly the same as the stock downstairs. So it's like, so the same stock at every point of the, what you might call the fiber of pi. And so how do you make the stocks compatible? Well, if you have an open set, uh, it does what you might think it does, which is uh, compatible. The, the compatible stocks will be, you just want uh, over the section, something which, well, how best to say it? You want them to be compatible. Uh, and what I mean by this, you have to ponder what I mean in a way that makes us nuts. And the advantage of this is that, for example, uh, the pullback, the inverse image of a sheaf of billion groups, of sheaves of billion groups, that's an exact functor. Why is that true? Well, because exactness you check on stocks and the stocks are all the same. So if you parse what this means, uh, it's an exact functor basically immediately once you set this up right. But the question is, how do you set this up right? Uh, and so how do you make this precise? Uh, and so you can think about that too. Uh, so that's a good definition. Uh, and that's a terrible definition. And now comes my, the, a definition which is uh, terrible, but also I have to, I wish we didn't need this definition. Uh, and this is always a definition that's given when you first see this inverse image sheaf because it's a definition unlike the other two. And so here's what you do. Uh, what you do is you simply first define a pre-sheaf pullback. Uh, pre-sheaf inverse image. And what is that? Well, that by itself is repulsive. Uh, I'll tell you what this pre-sheaf is by telling you what its sections are over any open set. And what I do is maybe I will make sure to have this picture here that you have a map from X and it goes to Y. And if you have an open set uh, on, uh, and I realize I should, I've got this backwards. Uh, so, great. So uh, I will tell you uh, what the sections are of this free sheaf uh, on some open set U of X. And what I'll do is I'll just consider all the open sets V that contain the image of U. The image of U is not open necessarily. So maybe you prefer to say that, that the pullback of V contains U. And then I'll take all those sections downstairs I'll take the co-limit, so it's something stock-like. Uh, and then, even then I'm not done. That's a pre-sheaf, that's not necessarily a sheaf. Uh, for experts, the question is why and where, and what's your, what's, is it a, does it, which, does it satisfy the identity axiom? And then finally, you sheafify it. And then that is your definition. So that's great, it's an actual construction. There's no question once you check that this is actually a pre-sheaf, that this is something. <laughs> it's an honest sheaf on X, uh, and the disadvantage is I find that it gives me no uh, formal insight and no geometric insight. So how do you fit these together in your head? Uh, the thing I find most useful is the following thing, which is to a different point of view, which uh, is not quite a definition, but it's the way to connect to all the other definitions. Uh, so here's my picture. Uh, so you have a map, okay, so we have, just to remind you what we have, we have a, a, a map from x to y by map pi, and we have a sheaf uh, on, whoops, we, we will have a sheaf on y and a sheaf on x, uh, and it's, uh, we're going to all possible sheaves on x, and my question is to somehow understand uh, something about uh, the sheaf on y, for example, and so uh, what I'll do is I'll identify one of the two things in the adjunction, for example, and that's going to also be the other thing in the adjunction. So here's the, the gadget, which is, going to which is going to somehow relate these two and also relate to the others. So what it is, is uh, it's going to be a, uh, a set. It's going to be like a, of maps. You think of it as like, like maps from a sheaves on Y to sheaves on X. And how does it work? Well, what I want to have, well, one of these maps is going to be the data of for every open set in U and open set in V, sorry, open set in X and open set in Y, uh, where U maps to V, uh, I just want a map that 
tells me how to take sections of the guy downstairs over B to sections of the guy upstairs over U. And I want this to play well with restrictions upstairs and downstairs. So I can shrink U further, uh, or I can shrink things to V, and various things have to commute. And so once you make this definition, it's a thing. I mean, you've, you've given this given the situation, you've defined uh, something, which you can show very quickly is the left side of the junction, and really quickly is the right side of the junction. Uh, and more than that, it even relates well to everything that came, uh, all the different ways of thinking about this space, but you can get to stocks quickly, you can get the espace de So this is the thing I find useful. And the thing you have to do on your own uh, is to make this all hold together in your mind, because you really, in order to use the inverse image sheaf, which is going to be uh, really useful uh, and important, you have to really know how to think about it the right way. And that's something which is uh, something you have to do on your own. Refresh. Great. So here's some examples, uh, and uh, it's going to this notion will come up later repeatedly. But I still want to give some now, uh, but maybe not enough for you to really appreciate what's going on fully. So uh, one example that corresponds to something you've seen before is that if you if x is just a point, uh, a mapping to a space, and you and you have a sheaf on y, what's the inverse image? It, re it re retrieves for you the stock. Why is that? Well, it's because it um, uh, is, well, uh, take your, well, I should say you have to think about, take your definitions and make it work. Uh, secondly, if, you, if X is an open subset, kind of the opposite of a point, then you end up getting just the restriction of that sheaf to X. Uh, and there's also an espace étalé, if you have like a covering space uh, of Y, uh, and you uh, and you want to consider the sheaf of sections of that covering space, whatever that means. Uh, I guess it means what it means. Then it turns out that the uh, inverse image sheaf is a sheaf of sections of the pullback. That's enlightening only if you are happy with covering spaces and this passe tele. Oh, and one thing I should have said, let me go back one step to this, is that this point of view really does tell you how to construct something because um, if you have G, and you try to understand what the inverse image of G is, well then let me set F equals the inverse image of G. So inside, so that's gonna be something which I'm understand what the identity is here. So what we'll do is we'll understand it by figuring out what are the things uh, that, will, uh, that will make this work. Uh, and that will, uh, maybe this is not so helpful. This is something where all I can say is you have to go in the mountains uh, and for several months and ponder things uh, and uh, uh, and become gradually happy with it. Okay, last uh, last sheaf you thing to discuss for now is the notion of the support of a section of a sheaf. And so the situation again is you have a topological space and you have a sheaf. Now let's say you have a billion groups because I want to know when things are zero. And so. Uh, and so let's say I have a section of my sheaf over some open set. Uh, and I want to define the, uh, so I want to define uh, the support of this section and my definition is as follows. It's those points of the open set where it has non-zero germ. Uh, and not, that doesn't mean non-zero value. Non-zero value has no meaning, it means uh, it's not a uh, non-zero germ means that there is an honest open set containing P where it is not the zero function. My, so in this picture we have, uh, I want to say that in this picture, S is an S has non-zero germ. Uh, so here's our open set and there is S and it's kind of zero here and it goes up like that. Um, then it's got non-zero germ at all of these points, including this point here, but then it has zero germ afterwards. And I would observe, this doesn't even deserve the name of an exercise uh, of a, well, okay, maybe exercise, sure. Now this is a closed subset, In other, uh, or equivalently, the complement is open just for the obvious reason that what's the complement? The complement is where it does have zero germ. And if you have zero germ, it means that by compatible germs, it comes from something which is, oh, that must mean that it actually is zero in a neighborhood. And then it has zero germ everywhere in the neighborhood. So this means that the support is closed. And just to uh, uh, say what is, so uh, I've said all the 
stuff that's substantive, but here's the thing which is you will be confused by, which is the uh, is is that uh, so let me get, do this by confusing you. So if you have a complex manifold and your and your sheaf in question is the sheaf of holomorphic functions, and so let's take this as our picture or cartoon of what's going on, then the locus where the section uh, is non-zero is open. The section the locus where section vanishes is closed. That was a really essential point that's going to come up again even later today that you told me you wanted earlier on uh, a few weeks ago. So the locus where it's non-zero value is open, but where it has non-zero germ is closed. And that's because these really are two different things. One is where is S not zero at a, at, at a point? At what points is it not zero? And versus at what points is it not the zero function near it? So near and at are two different, uh, uh, I find useful to say uh, there's the notion of at and near, and you want to distinguish those two notions in your head. Um, also, uh, the last thing I might as well say is that there's a notion of support of an entire sheaf where you just simply take, uh, where you simply take the locus where all the stocks are, uh, uh, take locus of stocks that are not just zero, take the closure of that. So stupidly, it's a closed set because I took the closure. Uh, and the idea is that this is where the germs are not zero, so it's where the sheaf really lives. So really there's a sheaf on the support, which you could even write this way in terms of the inverse image sheaf. Uh, and, and the original sheaf is really the push forward uh, uh, of the thing living on top of that. But this is not important in the technical sense that we're not gonna use it anytime soon, but it is important to in real life. And let me go back. Great. So that with that, I think we are good with, uh, with what we need topologically. And now we're ready to uh, concentrate fully on affine varieties and affine schemes. I am now going to uh, potentially see if, there, if it's worth uh, asking for questions. Let me, I may lose my screen share by doing this. So let me just quickly check it. Okay. So now I will ask shepherds, let me know if you think I should, especially those that are uh, synchronized with me, if I should uh, repeat something or if there is something on uh, that people are confused about before I move on to this. Okay, so if, uh, great. So at this point, I think, uh, great. Uh, I'm gonna put things so I can actually see some of you a little bit. Uh, great. Um, let me know if the screen share mysteriously dies again, but uh, if, uh, but I'll assume not otherwise. So let's talk more about varieties and schemes, uh, and let me uh, let me just uh, remind you that given a ring, I want to define uh, the spectrum to be the set of prime ideals, and then I want to define this max spec or m spec. Uh, to be just the maximum ideals, but I only want to really talk about this when we're dealing with finely generated algebras over a field. So whenever I say M spec, that is always, always, always what I'm uh, assuming. And if someone wants to say the word Jacobson ring or things like that, they are free to, but they're not on, um, uh, but I can't hear them. And so there's a definition I should have made, which is N space, what I would call N space over your field, which in the case of, uh, which if, you're think, if you are thinking about M specs, then that's what it is. If you're thinking about specs, then it's the spec. Uh, and the point I'm gonna emphasize is that if the field is algebraically closed, then this is literally K bar to the N, K to the N. But, and so, but what we're actually defining should be seen as the generalization of M space. And this is, so the A is for affine, I, that, I guess. N is for the dimension, K is for the, the field. Okay. And now I'm ready to, uh, uh, I, I also realized I should have said something, which is when people use the word ring, they mean sometimes different things. And uh, sometimes I think other people are just wrong, uh, of course, but I, other times there are good reasons for different definitions in different places. So uh, we will have the ring being commutative uh, always, unless I say otherwise. Uh, also uh, every ring, okay, of course every ring has a zero, I think, 
it's only reasonable that every ring has a one as well. Uh, there, there are, as you define a non-unital ring, Lang calls it a ring, R-N-G, I think, because it has no I. Uh, yeah, and the one thing which I think is potentially, is, one could argue about, uh, but here's where I am convinced that this is the only reasonable definition, is that you allow the possibility that zero is equal to one. Uh, so some definitions will say zero is not one, they are required to be distinct. I'm not doing this. And, the, and I can explain why later, they're like, there are a bunch of reasons why this is the right thing to do. Uh, but if you allow this, the thing I want to point out is that you have a really stupid ring because one times anything is zero times anything. So everything's got to be zero. So there's only one element. Uh, so the ring is a zero ring. And so why, like, wh so why am I making a big deal about allowing this uh, as a ring? Well, okay, well, uh, you'll, it just makes things, life will be tough if you don't make this a ring uh, and you have to go, go through contortions. So, okay, now comes uh, some stuff which is either depending on how, who you are, will make you excited or make you sad. Uh, and so I'm gonna assume the axiom of choice. And in particular, the axiom of choice implies, and you can, uh, and there's a short argument which you can, uh, if, if you've seen one like it before, it's obvious how it goes. If you haven't seen how one before, you can read it, but I think it's not so obvious how you make this argument work. Uh, the axiom of choice says that if there's any non-zero ring, then it, uh, every non-zero ring has a maximal ideal. The non-zero ring has no maximal ideal because it's got no ideals that are not the entire thing. Uh, yeah, and so the way the argument begins is if you have a non-zero ring, it's got an ideal, which is not the entire ring, which is the zero ideal. Uh, and then you blah, 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 blah. And then you, and then this is something which should be frightening. And if it makes you feel better, uh, anything you prove about honest, real things, like if you prove Fermat's last theorem and you use the axiom of choice, then it's still gonna be true, uh, even, if the, even if for people who don't believe the axiom of choice. So this could make you happy. But I, I kind of think that, I don't know what it means, what a reasonable ring actually means. And so I'm much happier just to assume this. So you're all welcome. There are religious wars in Europe from 1618 to 1648 over this issue, but I think we've moved beyond that now. Uh, so the one thing to, to really, that's gonna be strangely useful, we we'll use it very, very soon in a very important way is that we just want rings to have maximum ideals as long as they are not the zero ring. Okay. So great, so here is our dictionary between algebra and geometry, which is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. And what you should do is make your own dictionary uh, and your dictionary is going to be, is going, is, uh, going to get very long. So I hope your computer has lots of memory uh, or you have lots of paper. So I've already defined, made a bunch of definitions and let me make some new definitions. Um, so the, I've made on the geometry side, I've just defined uh, a bunch of things and I've, uh, and I've, including words like point. And now I'm gonna make defin more definitions on the geometry side. Any element of the ring, I'm gonna call a function on that, uh, on spec or m spec. And, when, and then I'll define the value of the function at a point to be, uh, to be f mod that prime ideal. And I'll say f is zero or vanishes at p if f is in that prime ideal. This is a definition, this is not, uh, 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 so this is something which will be, uh, which, I, which may be confusing. Okay, so for example, on the plane, on A2 over your field, uh, and you, if you have a function x plus y, and you wanna know what its value is at two comma three, and I should say two comma three was our name for the corresponding to the maximal ideal, x minus two comma y minus three. Uh, then what is the, what's the meaning of this? Uh, well, it, you can check that x plus two is equal to five mod x minus two y minus three by the, I guess it's the remainder theorem, uh, x plus y, sorry, is five mod this. Uh, and, uh, and so, and of course, when x is two and y is three, x plus y is five. So somehow I'm saying two things which are, I don't know if they're obviously the same, but they are the same and, uh, and there's some connection you have to make in your mind. Uh, 
And then maybe to make this more, uh, to defam defamiliarize this a bit, how about on the prime ideal uh, zero uh, inside, uh, inside A2? Well, what I do need to do is take x plus y mod zero. So the value of x plus y is x plus y. That's just what it is. Uh, that's the, my, by definition, there's nothing to really ask about. But if you want to see something a little less familiar, 60 is a function on spec z. What's its value at, at seven? Well, it's 60 mod seven, which I could say is, oh, now I have to do some sort of division, which is gonna uh, hurt my head, but uh, uh, this is four mod seven. So I could say 60 has a value four at the, at the point seven. Uh, and that has a value zero at the point two. It has value zero at point three. It has uh, value, uh, well, you can see the pattern. Uh, and then, and that's weird because the function is taking values in different places at different points, but that's okay. It doesn't contradict my definition. And if you want to make it sound less exciting and more lame, I could say 60 has a value 60 at, at seven and has a value 60 at five and at two and at three. Uh, then that's less exciting. But then you can begin to ask things like, uh, okay, this function uh, vanishes to order two at the point. Here's my picture of spec C. Here's my various points. And here's at somewhere, I guess uh, Manin says, don't put it out here, but, uh, but put it somewhere above. There's the prime zero, which is a different flavor. And so the function 60 is somehow has a double zero at two. It has a single zero at three and five. And at seven, it doesn't vanish. In fact, it has value four. And so you get strange things like this that you can try to make sense of. And it's worth trying to make sense of them because you just end up discovering more and more uh, useful things. Great. So, uh, great. Okay, so now uh, I want to remind you of this correspondence uh, of uh, this is, uh, I guess uh, Taylor and many of the participants are at Vermont where Dummett and Foote are or were, uh, hopefully still are. Uh, and uh, so this is sort of like the, one of the few fundamental things to know in algebra. It's not, well, not in the setting, but there, uh, as, as a special case, something bigger, that, it, that, what are, that if you have ideals of a quotient correspond to ideals of the original thing containing the things you quotient by. Uh, and this is, and that, and this entire thing respects inclusions, uh, all possible reasonable things it respects. So for example, prime ideals of A mod I are exactly the same as prime ideals of A containing I, or maximal ideals of A mod I are maximal ideals of A containing I. Uh, and so you can think through this in some examples. So if you, for some of you are newish to this, and I feel like this is, this thing is like a really valuable thing to understand and not take on faith. Great. Uh, and harder is the notion of localization, which again, we've taught, we've seen a little bit in the first couple of weeks. Uh, and in here you have a multiplicative subset of, of your ring and the small set contains one. And what multiplicative subset means that if you take two elements of S, you multiply them together, you get another. Uh, so examples might be powers of a single element or things that are not contained in a prime, in a, in a prime ideal. So what this localization is, as I'm going to remind you, I think it's useful, uh, and this is why I'm going to bother saying it, even though I could just demand that you have seen it before. Uh, it, it's that when you were, I don't know how old you were at the time, when you learned about fractions, you were just told fractions are symbols like this. Uh, and there's there some rules for adding a multiply. But why does it work? And the answer is, well, I guess you need to have this rule. You might say lowest terms, uh, and, and you, uh, but you just want to say that two things are equal if this product is that product. But uh, surprise that if you try to make this precise to show that the resulting thing is a ring, uh, uh, if you are, when you're five years old, you're living in a land of integral domains, although you may not even think about that too. And so uh, when you're five, well, you're not proving this when you're five years old, uh, but that's why you never see this A3 when you learn about fractions for the first time. But when you have zero divisors, it turns out just to make things work, uh, or if you want just to satisfy the universal property, you need, oh, that's bad. I realize I should have not used that letter S, it should be, uh, it, uh, it should be an S. 
Oh, that isn't there. I put it there. Good. So that was a typo. Uh, and the answer, and so you need not, so in particular, if you invert, nothing is stopping you from inverting zero. The S could be in this subset. But if you invert zero, then you end up with the zero ring because any two of these fractions are the same because that's true for zero times anything is zero. So as long as you take this definition, if you want this to always exist, you're forced to include the zero ring. That's one reason why the zero ring has to be in here. And so some examples you should know is you could take, you could invert F. So you get this thing here, which is the same as adding a variable, adding one over F, which is adding a new thing, uh, which is the inverse of F, or you could define this. And I guess now I'm coming down to the point I wanted to make a couple of minutes ago, which is that the ideals of A not meaning S are exactly the ideals of S inverse A. And that's the, and all the same things are true, prime ideals, maximum ideals, uh, and so forth. Um, oh, sorry, no, I should not have said that. Prime ideals remain prime. And now you can, you get sort of some understanding if that this is not true if you take maximum ideals uh, necessarily. So where does this go wrong? And there's some insight in knowing what, that means you understand this, you know why maximum idea, I, I can't put maximal on both sides. Great, so, uh, great. So in conclusion, we, uh, you've got your, that means your specs, uh, you, in terms of specs of localizations are subsets of spec A, just like specs of quotients are subsets of spec A. Uh, and that's true for M specs for quotients, but for localization, for, uh, M specs, uh, in M specs, this is true. And maybe that's the thing which requires some under, uh, this is why M spec, uh, if you like M specs, you want to be working with only certain kinds of rings. Uh, if you want to consider maximum ideals, and this is one of the reasons why. So this could be a reason why you like specs better than M specs, even though you would have thought that M specs are the things which are more natural from geometry. Okay, so let me make some uh, let me draw some pictures. Uh, and so here, that means that we now can have, make sense of what, uh, of some of these pictures. What are the primes of this? Well, I can write down the primes of this. And we talked about that earlier. So there's A2 and there, it's got lots of points that are old fashioned points, but it also has some generic points of this curve and that curve and this other curve. And it's also got a generic point of everything. And where to draw these points, you can take your pick either, but it's, uh, and so now I'm ready to draw the subset corresponding to this ring, which is the locus of points for which y squared minus x cubed equals zero, which makes complete sense because we know about the values of functions. Uh, so that is a rigorous statement. So in particular, which points of the plane this is contained, the answer is those things that those things corresponding uh, that lie in this ideal, or which means the old fashioned points that lie on this curve, but also the point corresponding to this irreducible polynomial, but not the point corresponding to the entire plane. So this is something to uh, only, you can hear it, but you have to sleep on it a little bit. And now if you take similarly a localization, then this is, these are gonna be the primes on, of C adjoin X, Y, contained in x comma y. Now, what does that mean? And now this is the thing which you have to, again, come to terms with that it's in terms of close, in terms of the old fashioned points, it's only gonna be the origin. And then you're gonna have a bunch of other things like for example, y squared minus x cubed, that prime ideal is certainly contained in x comma y. Any multiple of y squared minus x cubed is certainly inside this ideal. So, uh, but for y minus x plus one, is not contained in, uh, and that's a, and so that's a line that doesn't meet the origin. And if you think about it, the, the kinds of ideals, principal ideals uh, that could lie inside here are precisely things that are irreducible polynomials that va vanish at the origin, or, uh, and, or it could be zero as well. So you're really remembering all of your parts of your picture of things that actually limit to the origin, that contain the origin. So, and, and you forget everything else that is not. And I cannot make this, uh, I can say more, but this is something where you have to make 
lots of examples your, uh, your, yourself. Okay. Now, uh, okay, so now comes uh, an important thing to say that functions are not determined by their values. This is something I should say that you may have seen before in a different context that people find confusing, which is polynomials in, uh, so elements of the polynomial ring of FP uh, have, value, uh, have values at the various elements of FP, but there are non-zero polynomials that have value zero at every element of the field. So already in life, you've seen that functions in a different context are not determined by the values of points. But let me say why in this case, which is not quite the same reason, and the reason there are no potents. Uh, so the, so the, the statement is this, well, I'm gonna point out that if you have a function that is zero at all points, is it must it be the zero function? Well, no, because, well, I guess proof by example is that here's a, a ring where X, it's got only one, prime ideal, which is a prime ideal, uh, which is a prime ideal generated by X. Or I guess well, I'll let you think about why that's true. It's, uh, and, but then you have a function, say two X, and it's not the zero function. It's not the zero element of the ring. I told you we defined functions are the elements of A, not up to any other thing like that, but it does vanish at the point. So that is weird. And so why is that weird or how is that happening? Well, it happens, because the function we mentioned has, it wasn't zero, but it had a power that was zero. And it's certainly true that a function whose power is zero in an integral domain or a field, it must be zero to begin with. So the problem is evaluation gives you value in not in a general ring, but in an integral domain. So let me def make a definition, which is the radical of the zero ideal, uh, which I'm gonna call the, which I'm gonna call the nil radical, uh, which I cannot draw because you have to be, I think you have to be a German citizen to be able to draw a math fractor. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's, so these are things whose power is zero. And this is an ideal. You can think about why that's true. And more generally, I could define uh, the same thing to define what's called the radical of, uh, of an ideal. So let me make that definition as well. And so, and we want to say that if an ideal, an ideal certainly is contained in this radical, and if uh, uh, and so I'm going to say that if it's equal to its radical, then we call the ideal a radical ideal. So that's our that's our definition, and a re it's a reasonable one to have it, to give a name to because it's going to exactly tell us when functions are not determined by their values. Okay, so now comes the uh, ac now comes the bizarre. Uh, a, a, a bizarre argument uh, that uh, that if you haven't seen it before. It's like it's devastatingly clever. So my my claim is that if you intersect all the prime ideals, uh, then you get the no radical. You get those elements whose power have some power that's zero. Uh, and so why is that true? Well, and this is basically saying that though this is the algebra statement that comes corresponds to the geometric statement that the functions vanishing at every point are exactly those that, who have the power that's zero. So one direction is super easy uh, because for sure that if, if x to the n is zero, then x must be in any prime ideal. Uh, so that's, that's how primality works. Uh, so uh, uh, great, but, but now here's the other direction. Uh, so suppose you have something that's in, a, in P for every prime ideal, P. How do you know, how do you figure out uh, where, uh, how do you figure out what power of it is zero? Well, here's the trick. Consider the ring A inverted X. So just a reminder, you're localizing. So uh, you're adding an inverse. So there's the, a nice ring you're defining. And the prime, okay, so that's, so uh, what are the primes of this ring? Well, the primes of this localization are those primes the primes of this localization are the primes of A not meeting, not containing any element of the things you inverted. But every prime of A contains X, that's our assumption. So A sub X has no prime ideals, in particular no maximal ideals. But because we are believers in the axiom of choice, this means that a sub x is the zero ring. 
And if a sub x is a zero ring, that means that one equals zero. And if one equals zero, that means that there's an element of, the, of this multiplicative subset such that it times the kind of this times this minus this times this is zero. So x to the n is zero, end of proof. So we now know this thanks to the axiom of choice. And that is like, so that's, uh, I, I think I love this. Maybe I hate it. Um, it's a kind of a, uh, maybe I hate this argument, but it's just, it, it's certainly devastating. Yeah. Okay, so that's uh, great. So, uh, so in particular, we have something which is geometry and we, uh, which translates to something which is algebra. Uh, and then if you want to see if you understand this, uh, you could yourself figure out why if it has non-zero value at all points. So zero value means no potent. Zero everywhere means no potent. Non-zero everywhere, means that it's a unit. Uh, and I'll let you think about that. And once again, the axiom of choice uh, potentially turns up. Great. Uh, and then you could also, as practice, just check uh, to see if you can have any proof. And then better yet, a one-line proof that the radical of an ideal uh, is, uh, is the intersection of all prime ideals containing i. Uh, and the, and, uh, and there's, a, the common, there's a common trick, which you'll see uh, uh, all, all the time in algebra and EGA and other places that, uh, that you, you always take a ring and if there's an ideal in question, you, you uh, mod out by it uh, and you can do that ring instead. Or if it's a prime ideal, you localize the way uh, uh, there. And so you can think about that. Okay, so uh, last, uh, so uh, next notion is that if you have a, a ring homomorphism, then you have a map of sets of spectra in the opposite direction. And uh, when we say, I'll say it in a way that's algebraically obvious, hopefully obvious, uh, but geometrically, it's gonna have a meaning too. So what this means is, so if you have a, uh, suppose you have a ring map, and I'm gonna tell you, if I give you a prime ideal of A, how do you get a prime ideal of B? Well, what is a prime ideal of A? A prime ideal of A is a map from, is given by a map from A to an integral domain or if you wish, a surjective map to integral domain. But let me say every map from A to an integral domain gives you a prime ideal. Uh, so uh, that, uh, and again, I should say, what is a map from A to integral domain? It's, it's a ring map, so it's got to send zero to zero and one to one. Uh, but if you have a map from B to A, then you have a map from B to an integral domain. So bingo, there's your prime ideal. Uh, and then uh, I, I should say that something similar happens for M specs. Uh, and so what's a maximum ideal of, of A when you have a finely generated ring over a uh, field? Well, it's a, it's a map to a finite extension of K. So here we are using the null Stalin stat. So this is a hard statement. This is easy. The expect thing is easy and the, and the, and the classical thing is hard. And then if you have a map from B to A, then you have a map from B to a finite extension of K. And hence that corresponds to a maximum ideal. So we need the null Stalin sets for A and for B to make this work. And the other thing I'll point out is that not only do you get a map of sets, sections of, of, of points, also functions pull back the way you want, which is in other words, if you have a point uh, of spec B, sorry, a point of spec A and a point of spec B and the point of spec A maps the point of spec B and you have a function on spec B, which has a value of Q, you could pull it back to value uh, uh, to a function on spec A by way of this map, and its value at P uh, is going to be the, the, the same as the value at Q. So what does that mean? Parse the geometry, turn it into algebra, and realize it's a tautology, which is the thing you would most want. So now we are, uh, we are nearing, uh, so we're at nine o'clock uh, here, and I started, uh, you know, so I'm gonna end now or very soon, uh, although I'm not getting as far as I wanted thanks to my the host of small technical difficulties, but let me say a few things. Uh, one really important, I want to say some things to conclude this topic. Uh, so uh, as some examples, you have these ring maps of quotienting and localizing, and what you get are, exact, are ex the maps which the inclusions we had before. Uh, and uh, as another example, to see it in action, here's a map 
from uh, from the complex numbers to uh, from C to C2. Although the fact that we're talking about complex numbers is not relevant, we're going to send T to T, T squared comma T cubed. So what does that mean? So that you already know geometrically what that means. But now let me tell you the algebra, which is that uh, the algebra will send the ring of functions on C2 to the ring of functions on C. And what does that map? Well, x goes to t squared, y goes to t cubed. And that should, you should realize that that's exactly the same information. And to see that this makes you, to see if you can understand that this is true uh, or how this works, here's a map from c cubed to c fourth. And if I'm going to start first with the geometry, and now I'll tell you what the algebra is. The algebra is going to take uh, the, uh, let's say the coordinates on C4 are A, B, C, and D. The coordinates on C3 are X, Y, and Z. Then my algebra map, my ring map, is going to send A to X squared plus Y cubed. My uh, B it will get sent to 3 Y, Z, uh, C to X, Z, and D to 3 Y to the ninth. So that's so you can see that uh, you can see that correspondence. And now I'll tell you, I'll point out that you also know how to get from algebra to geometry. So now I'm going to give you a ring map, and I want you to tell me what that is geometrically. So my ring map. Let me just make this. Let me make this a bit harder for you. Now I'm going to tell you a ring map, and my ring map is going to be a map from C adjoining A B C D to C adjoining X Y Z. I want to send A to X squared plus Y cubed, B to three Y Z. C to X, Z, e, and D to 3, Y to the ninth. What is the corresponding geometric map? Well, I'll let you figure out what that is. And you'll realize that how that this is really, two, these are really two sides of the same coin. Okay. So uh, with that, I think I will call it a, a, a day, but let me just say what's coming next and the things we'll talk about uh, next week, uh, which are going to, and uh, although at this point you can, uh, read ahead as well. Uh, now the goal was to produce, was to describe these things as uh, ringed spaces, as topological spaces with sheaves of rings. We've got the set, what's the topology? And I'm gonna say that you already know the topology because you told me uh, earlier that when, where, if you had one of these nice geometric spaces, the locus where every any function vanishes needs to be a closed subset in order for us to say things that we wanted to say already. So, uh, and, and, or to put differently, locus where a function doesn't vanish should be open. So that's what we're going to need for our topology. And so I hope whatever we define satisfies that. How do we ensure that happens? We make that the definition. So that's, as long as we make that the definition, it will satisfy that. And so you've defined the Zersky topology. And now you can read what it is, know what the closed subsets are, what the open subsets are. Um, and the, the key thing is that the closed subsets are the locus where functions, a bunch of functions vanish. Certainly where one function vanishes should be closed. And because when you intersect a bunch of closed subsets, it should still be closed. What this means is the closed subsets are of spec A are precisely those points where some bunch of functions vanish. And that satisfies the notion of a topology. And once you do that, you define the Zersky topology. Uh, and so the closed subsets, again, are those cut up by a bunch of equations. And if you do some examples, you will uh, and, uh, actually do the right examples. You'll you'll have a good sense of what the Zersky topology is like, and it will seem less strange uh, than you might think. Uh, even though it's a very blunt tool, there's somehow the only, if you're only allowed to talk about things that are algebraic and not things like signs and uh, and and analytic things. These are the only closed subsets you're allowed to talk about, even if you're talking about C2 or C3 or something like that. So that's what I encourage you to look at next, and we will continue next week.